Hi, Jonathan. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Um, I, t I tell you why I thought this conversation would be really apt is for a lot of people, the last 12 months have been crisis. Yeah. It's been a crisis whether you run a business, mm -hmm. it's been a crisis whether you're an employee, uh, and it's generally been crisis all around, even for students and everyone, because quite frankly, no one saw this coming. Yeah. And, and, and I think history is littered with crises, mm -hmm. um, both that could have been preventable, that were on the radar, um, and that could be because a competitor had already done it. Yeah. Uh, still didn't take note. It could be you could sense it in your blood uh, within the firm, in the business, because little things keep going wrong. You think yeah. this is all going to build up to something soon. So competitors, it could be something bubbling away. It could be actually a third party who walks in and points out something really straightforward and says, that's not working. Yeah. Um, lastly, before we go into it, um, actually, it could be your customers telling you mm -hmm. or your customers not telling you, uh, and there could be a crisis. So, okay, so Jonathan, it's all about how to manage a crisis, but I suppose the question people might be asking, why have I asked you? So, so maybe a bit of background into what brought us together and your experience of crisis, uh, and, and also, if in that in that introduction you, you know there's a there's an institute for everything but yeah. it's an institute for crisis management anyway off over to you jonathan <laughs> thanks nindra i'm really pleased to uh, join you on this on this podcast so uh let me give you kind of the headlines of who i yeah. am and what i do and maybe i'll explain then also why i do what i do um so i'm the managing director of a firm called insignia we're a specialist crisis management consultancy. And effectively what we do is we work with leaders and managers of businesses to help them plan, train, rehearse, and sometimes handle the worst days of their business lives. And that could be, as you've kind of hinted out already, it can be everything from a product recall to an environmental incident to a big accident at a, at, at a factory. It could be management misdeeds or misbehavior. And of course, most, most recently, yes, it has been the pandemic. And what we aim to do is to help business people develop the capabilities and the confidence to manage those challenging situations, whatever the world may throw at them. Um, and I said I'd explain briefly kind of why I do what I do. Um, I remember, gosh, it's best part of 30 years ago now, sitting in my parents' lounge with the old television in that big wooden frame like we all used to have. I can't even remember if it, if it was colour or black and white. And the programme was interrupted by an air crash at Kegworth, East Midlands Airport. This was a British Midland plane that came down on the M1. And what was really intriguing was that the news broadcaster was interviewing the chief executive from his car. And in 1989, I'd never seen a mobile phone. And this guy was doing an interview as he was traveling from his home to the scene of, 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 of the awful crash that had, had happened. And frankly, he was brilliant. It was, it was Michael Bishop. Uh, it, it was was his name and what he was doing he was showing that he cared he was showing that he was exerting kind of control and taking the right actions and in the days that followed he not only you know did all of the interviews at the scene and said all of the right things about how horrified he was and the actions that he was taking he also visited all of the injured at, at hospital and it was his actions and his behavior in the event of that crisis that got me really interested in the subject particularly of leaders in a crisis situation and it was that catalyst that ultimately led me to build a career in this area and the thing that really drives me is to help organizations avoid the needless damage that a crisis can cause and it's damage to the business itself in terms of its, its value and its reputation but just as importantly, it's damage to its stakeholders. So, you know, in the event of a mishandled crisis, people lose their jobs. Communities lose valuable employers. 
um, people may even lose their lives or livelihoods. So I'm driven by a desire to help business people be ready to do and say the right thing so that they look after themselves, but they also look after those affected by a crisis. And to answer your question, um, there is no real uh, established official crisis management institute there is a business continuity institute which is kind of closely related and there are risk management associations um, but there is not yet a crisis management institute perhaps i should start one absolutely i think <laughs> it might be good right now now what's interesting jonathan um and what was intriguing is when you mentioned crisis management to people yeah and they type in crisis management what will pop up is loads and loads of PR companies yeah, who will say, we'll manage your crisis. But of course, the problem with that is you're, you are already in a crisis. Yeah. And so they're sort of saying, well, we'll come along and help you out of a crisis. But what your book, Crisis Proof, is arguing is it's too late. Yeah. It, it's too late. Yeah. What you need to do, and this is what we'll sort of explore, you need to plan for the crisis so that when the crisis happens, yeah. you are very prepared. And, and then if and when you need a PR agency, yeah. you're in a position to be proactive in telling them what the crisis is rather than running. Uh, so, it, so, so if you've got that right, so, so, so perhaps you could now, if I've got that sort of split right, what led you, bearing in mind there's no institute of, crisis management <laughs> yeah what led you then to write this book so a couple of the things you've touched on already Ninda absolutely I am a passionate advocate for the importance of preparing for the crisis not simply hoping that you will react in the right way when the crisis happens I believe that it is not a crisis itself that harms organizations and reputations, but it is what you do after the crisis has happened that may harm you, or alternatively, may reinforce all of the trust and relationships that you've built up with your, with your stakeholders because of what a fantastic job you do in responding to an extraordinary situation. So, Absolutely. I believe wholeheartedly that successful crisis management is more about what you do before the crisis that enables you to do the right thing when the crisis happens. There are some who will get lucky or who are truly inspired or who dodge a bullet, but I wouldn't want to put my firm's future and reputation and all those affected by it kind of on the flip of a coin, having not prepared for something which can be so uh, catastrophic. And I think the other thing to say, picking up on your question, is that communication and therefore PR firms are a very important part of uh, responding to a crisis. But it's not just about PR, it's not just about communication. You know, great and successful crisis management is about leadership, it's about being courageous in making the right decisions. It's about having the ability to properly address the problem. And it's about the ability to communicate and therefore retain the trust and confidence of your stakeholders. So it's a challenging ask. And in this you know, world of social media, rolling news, you know, everybody under a spotlight, waiting till the crisis happens to work out what you're going to do is a highly risky approach i would suggest you mentioned leadership so we'll come back to the question on as we sort of explore how you plan as to why despite i mean we've all heard about crises you mentioned one 30 odd years ago yeah um and and, and we hear a, there must be a corporate crisis i mean i could think of the bp problem yeah i can think of general ratner who you you talk about in the book yes um and, and and there's lots of other similar crises and and people and sort of leaders despite 30 years of knowledge yeah. continue to make the mistake so uh, what why is that and, and and is it because and then we'll move into, into the book and what you suggest is it because it's a reactive approach 
And, and remember earlier when I said you can sometimes learn from a crisis from a competitor. Yes. Is that, does that mean we're not learning or we're seeing a crisis, but it's someone else's problem until it hits us? So I'm going to try and cover off both parts of that question, Ninja, and I'll deal with the second one first, the, the learning from a crisis. Um, the best organisations do exactly what you say. When they see a competitor having a crisis, they get their management team around a table and they say, do you know what? It's happened to them. It could happen to us. What would we do if that happened? It's a great way of doing some almost ad hoc crisis management planning of your own. And because it's a competitor, it's that much more real. You know, it feels like something that could affect your organization. So the best organizations do that. One of our clients is, is, um, is Cathay Pacific and their head of crisis management, whenever there is an air crash or even you know, an incident within the avi aviation industry, they will pull it apart and look for every possible learning that they can take out of it. I'd also encourage people to learn from near misses. Maybe the crisis doesn't happen, but you avoid it by the skin of your teeth. That's a really good opportunity to, to say, you know, what would have happened if this had got, if this had got worse? Other organisations, sadly, don't want to think about bad things happening and they feel that, you know, business as usual and rah, rah, rah and going for growth, which of course is really important, should always take priority over planning for the worst case. And I certainly think that going for growth and the rah, rah, rah should take more of your time than planning for the worst case, but just some of your time and energies should be focused on planning for the worst case. The other part of your question was about why experienced, successful, smart business people appear to do irrational uh, things when presented with a crisis. And in simple terms, I think there are two parts to that. One is emotional and one is practical. So on the emotional side, a crisis, unless you are a very unlucky organisation, is an extraordinary event that doesn't happen all of the time. You know, maybe in a chief executive's career, they might have to face three serious crisis situations, but each of those is a potentially existential threat to the organisation. Because of that, the adrenaline starts flowing, even for experienced, successful business people, you know, the back of the neck starts tingling, the head starts to get tighter, cortisol takes over, and the amygdala part of the, the brain, that's the kind of uh, primitive man part of, of the brain, pushes people into fight, flight, or freeze mode. And so people are not able, particularly in the early stages of a crisis, to make well-considered um, logical decisions. Then there's all sorts of other kind of emotional and personal pressures coming uh, coming at you. This is a high pressure situation. You've got people, employees, customers, investors, the media knocking your door down. You know, as someone senior within this organization, that your job could be on the line if this goes wrong. Your employees' jobs could be on the line, the value of the business, the reputation. You don't have the information that you want. You don't have the time that you need. All of those things put the individual under extraordinary pressure. And the rational and kind of practical side of, it, of, the, of that is that normal ways of working don't work in a crisis. So what happens is from a practical point of view, if you haven't done your planning beforehand, you don't have the necessary tools, resources and ways of working that you need to endure the crisis. So emotional and rational means that people are unable to do and say the right things when they need to do so the very most. Could it also be um, the type of organisation, the size of organisation, the personality of the man at the top? So, so yeah. I'll give you an example. Most entrepreneurs I meet are very positive thinking. Yes. Never think negative. Yeah. Never think downside. Yeah. Prefer to be nimble. Don't yeah. like to put structures and overdue processes. 
and they're the ones probably most at risk. If you join a billion pound business or you're a CEO, you've probably got a board of non-execs yeah. that you'll report to yeah. uh, who will focus not on the entrepreneurial flair, but will yeah. focus on the risk side. Yeah. And so you tend to see more risk assessments, yeah. more risk profile. And, and certainly as somebody who, who's a Ned who sits on some of these boards, I can see the radical difference yeah. between how I run my business yes. as an entrepreneur, small business, versus sitting in a 2.3 or 3. Point billion pound business, yeah. which does focus a lot on risk management. So yeah. that probably does explain some of it. I think that's a really great point, and I would absolutely concur with it. I think one of the interesting things I would say is the enlightened entrepreneurs as they grow their business, they will recognize there comes a point at which you have got a lot to lose. And frankly, sometimes that's when organizations start talking to us. You know, when you're very small, a startup, I wouldn't expect you to invest, you know, time and money in crisis management planning in the first couple of years. But when you've got to a point at which you've got an established reputation, you've got an established business, you've got something to lose, that is the time when the entrepreneur should be saying, do you know what, I need to be protecting this. You wouldn't, you know, proceed without normal business insurance, for example. It's a pain having to pay for it, but you know you need to be protected for the worst case. And what I'd also say, by the way, is you're right that some of the characteristics of your stereotypical entrepreneur might to some extent run counter to some of the principles of crisis management. But what I'd also say is some of the characteristics are absolutely essential in a crisis. For example, being prepared to make quick decisions, even when you don't have all of the information. Entrepreneurs are used to doing that, you know, grabbing opportunities, moving fast. I think um, also, you know, you are looking for people that can be both creative and nimble in a crisis. Creative sounds like a strange word to be using in crisis management. But if you think of all the creativity that emerged during the pandemic around how can we work how can we operate without all of our people around us uh, and with a completely alien environment people showed enormous creativity during uh, during the pandemic so um, it's a great point and there are elements of the entrepreneurial mindset which can uh, be in intention with crisis management but there are also bits of it which are absolutely essential to crisis management I think we just move up before we move on to the book is just just sort of concluding that point. I, I, I almost think uh, a board or, or, or a decision making, uh, yeah. the people that are in the decision making process almost need both. Yeah, you need you need the yeah. creative, sharp minded, sharp thinking, entrepreneurial mind. Yeah, but honestly, you also need the ones who think brilliantly in black and white situations yeah. are yeah. very calm. Yeah. very collected, look at the data, are very precise. And when you put the two together, yeah. I think that makes a, a great place to be. But I think that's probably the right mix that will know that you need to prepare for a crisis yeah. rather than have to react. So, so moving on to your book then, yeah, uh, it's called Crisis Proof. And, and, and you do talk about sort of a, a lot of principles that you can use to sort of prepare for a crisis. Um, so let me just quote, you, you summarize sort of six challenges for organizations that don't prepare for mm -hmm. a crisis, they don't. Uh, so maybe pick a couple of them, you know, as, as to yeah. how, what, how they hamper an effective response. Well, I mean, first of all, perhaps I can go back to uh, something I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, normal ways of working don't work. So these days, quite rightly, for example, organizations are consultative and you know they take some time to canvas opinions you know do their research and then make make decisions that whole process needs to be accelerated dramatically in a crisis and the amount of consulting that you can do is dramatically reduced so um, if people apply their normal pace and mode of working in a crisis, you will fall way behind the crisis itself. Instead, 
you still need to absolutely take the views of your team and stakeholders, but you need to do it in a very prescriptive, pacey manner. And then you need to make decisions based on what you understand at that time. So if you try and operate as business as usual, you will, you will fail. Um, a second and really important uh, thing that I see time and time again with inexperienced um, teams operating in crisis, and this is quite understandable, but they act, they start acting without thinking. And that's because, again, partly because we've got all this adrenaline flowing, also partly because managers and leaders like to be fixers, so they want to do something. And there's also an understandable kind of tendency to think, I need to be doing things. There's a massive problem here. I need to be doing things. I haven't got time to think. I just need to do. Actually, thinking before acting is critical in a crisis. And specifically, the thing that people should do is set what we call their strategic intent right at the start of the crisis. Despite everything going on around you, spend 15 minutes with your team agreeing and articulating very clearly at the end of this crisis where do we want to get to what does success look like before we then start doing things why is that so important well it aligns the team around a single goal so everybody is working to the same objective Secondly, it means we can prioritise what we do on the things that are most likely to lead to that end goal, because in a crisis, resources are always in short supply. And you're not, not going to be able to do everything you'd like to do by knowing your end point. It helps to make decision making easier. It aligns the team and it enables you to prioritise your actions. So there's a couple of things that I would advise people to recognise, you know, a pacier, more accelerated, more focused and structured way of working. But that should always be based upon setting your strategic intent. I love the 15 minute thing. You sit people down. But what do you do? I think I know the answer to this is, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Hmm. But what do you do about a multi-site or a multinational organization that has a crisis like that? So even if a small company could be multi-site, how, how do you get around that cascading of yeah. what success looks like? So again, I'll try and keep this answer relatively short and focused because it's a really big issue in crisis management. It's actually one of the other kind of major pitfalls and traps the, the trap being that the efforts across a multinational or multi-site organization are not coordinated and that is a again a very common flaw and problem in crisis response so making sure that it is coordinated is essential i will bang my preparation drum again to say first of all determine before the crisis the respective roles and responsibilities of head office and your and your individual sites. And if the crisis is happening at this site, they've had a fire or an explosion or a flood, you know, what are their roles and responsibilities and what is head office's role and responsibilities? So again, you're not working that out when the fire's happening. You've already decided that in this situation, you'll be responsible for doing that and will be responsible for doing that. And Broadly, best practice would say that um, head office or you know the corporate team, however we want to describe them, they should be setting the overall strategic intent, what success looks like, what I was talking about earlier. They should be providing direction and they should also be providing support for their site. But the team on the ground, in an ideal world should be empowered to make their own kind of local decisions about how to fix this problem now and to get on with doing that again one of the other traps is corporate head office wants to micromanage every single little decision in the crisis and you know you get the chief executive suddenly going back to his old career as an engineer telling someone how to plug the hole in the pipe not your job head office set strategic uh, intent 
provide direction, provide support, give the local team parameters, but then let them get on with fixing the problem. So back to leadership then. So, so this is regardless of size of business, regardless of mm -hmm. sector of business, um, regardless of the kind of people that work in the business. So yeah. how do you create, how do you encourage leaders, as I said, irrespective of size of business, because we spoke about even small businesses, how do you create that crisis resistant culture? How do you encourage, and, and I've told you how on the big boards, yeah, there because every board meeting we have a risk profile. It's one of the agenda items. Yeah, we go through them, so it's part of the set. Yeah, but how do you encourage apart from the big firms where the Neds ask for that? How do you encourage and how do you create a crisis resistant culture? So I would say that creating a crisis resistant culture is one of the most important things that a leader or a leadership team can can do, because clearly, by definition, uh, the best crisis management of all is the crisis management efforts that prevent the crisis happening in the first place place. And that's what a crisis resistant culture does. And as with all elements of business culture, it is led from the top so that this has to be something that leaders and managers do what do we what do i mean by a crisis resistant culture well let me give you some examples of um the opposite uh which probably makes the point even more powerfully one of the characteristics of a culture which is likely to be a breeding ground for crisis is one in which people are not allowed or don't feel able to challenge people in power, authority, or even who have influence. So, you know, the old fashioned managing director or chief executive whose word is the law and doesn't want to hear bad news. I don't want to hear bad news. Don't bring it to my door. Go away. You know, that is a recipe for disaster. What you actually want is you want to welcome early warning of bad news because early warning of bad news means you can avert it before it's become a crisis if you've created a culture in which people are too scared to say boss i think there's something going wrong here then you will only find out when you know the water's up to here and it's almost too late you want to find out when the water's lapping around your toes and that requires you to create psychological safety and you know a, a a no blame culture for people flagging up issues nice and early a second thing that you need to be aware of is what are the incentives and targets that i am putting in place or that we are putting in place and what might that mean for our crisis culture so for example a very simple example if all incentivization and targets are based on sales that encourages people to sell as much of the stuff as possible and to get as much of it out of the door as possible equally if it's a production target the higher the production the bigger the bonus well what that might mean is that the guys in production will probably subconsciously cut one or two corners in order to get maximum number of products out of out of the factory if there were also incentives around quality and health and safety you balance up that focus on um you you balance out that focus purely on getting the stuff out of the door so there's a couple of elements of um crisis culture setting the right incentives um and also ensuring that people are free to raise their hand when they see a problem. Um, there are other elements, but you know, there's a, a couple of examples there, Ninda. It's, it's a brilliant point, Jonathan, because I was uh, interviewing very recently for the podcast, I was interviewing um, Greg Reed, CEO of HomeServe. Yeah. And then in, before he joined, they were incentivizing the engineers, the people who go into your house, not by the quality of the work, but by yeah. the number of jobs they could do that day. Yeah. And when that cascaded right across the board in terms of all their engineers, customer service went down, 
Yeah. One or two repairs went down, and guess what? They had a crisis. Yeah. Share prices plummeted by 25%. Yeah. And they were lambasted for yeah. their customer service. So that led to a crisis. So I think that is just a brilliant point. And that's what um, Greg said when he came in. He, he understood that. Yeah. He looked at the data, looked at the products, looked at, and then he set about correcting that. Yeah. And that's how they got out of that crisis. And the firm is absolutely flourishing. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Now, we talk about preparing uh, yeah. for a crisis. Um, and you talk about in the book, mm-hmm. exercising, um, so, so avoiding that freeze yeah. response. And I'll tell you what that reminds me of. That reminds me of weekly fire alarms. Ah, uh, yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple of ways. After a while, you become immune to it. But actually, mm-hmm. the whole purpose of the fire alarm is to check that it works and people yeah. understand. Yours. Is that the type of thing you're referring to? It's It can be. I mean, you will have read the story in the book, Ninda, but let me, you know, tell the story of Rick Rescola because I think it's a really, really powerful one and it very much links with, with what you just said. Rick Rescola was actually a Cornish man who emigrated to the States and became the security manager at Morgan Stanley. Um, and Morgan Stanley was based at the World Trade Center. In 1993, there was a truck bomb in the basement of the World Trade Center. Rick Rescola was in his role at that time. And after that event, he became convinced that the next terrorist attack, and he believed it would come, would come from the air rather than rather than the ground. And so as a consequence, despite the fact that Morgan Stanley's 2,700 people were based on 22 of the highest floors on the North Tower, every three months for the next eight years, everybody would unannounced hear the fire alarm, have to stop work, stand up, leave their desks, go to the stairs, walk down, goodness knows how many flights of stairs to the muster point, and then go back up again. And if you imagine these are, you know, city types who are doing deals and, you know, time is money. They really didn't like going up and down the stairs every, every three months and losing, you know, 20 minutes of time when they could have been trading. Come 9-11, eight years later, the alarms went off. Everybody in the Morgan Stanley offices knew exactly what to do. Nobody finished that email that they were writing. Everybody put the phone down on the call they were, they were having. Everybody knew where the stairs were. They knew to go down in a purposeful but not rushed manner, and they knew exactly where to assemble. The consequence of that was that of the 2,700 people that worked at Morgan Stanley at that time, only 11 died, which was significantly lower than other businesses based at a similar level on, on, on the, uh, in the Twin Towers. The sad part of the story is, is that Rick Rescorda was actually one of those 11 people. He was last seen going back up the stairs to try and get those last few people out. So you know, that is a specific but a very good example of why rehearsing your response to a crisis builds mental or even physical muscle memory so that when the pressurized event occurs, everybody knows and intuitively does the right thing. And it applies, yes, to simple things like fire drills, but it also applies to the leadership team and how they work in a crisis. I talked earlier on about normal ways of working don't work. Well, therefore, you have to have rehearsed what these different ways of working are to have any hope of being able to deploy them when the worst happens. So it is doing as many rehearsals and exercises uh, as are required to give you confidence that you will do the right things when the balloon goes up. Again, your your um, again when I when I read it, there's so much in there about preparation, yeah. all about preparation. Um, so, so what? How would I know I've got an effective crisis management plan? Because you talk about planning, putting one together, and and I suppose it's a question I asked you when we spoke on the phone, uh, and when I think about COVID, um, you know, when you ask someone in a team to say, right, let's all now list 
and I, and I think about the risk registers that I look yeah. at. Let's list all the risks we can think of yeah. and have a plan. But it's the one that gets you is the one you never thought of. Yeah. Because you can't you you can't think of everything. It's the one that comes right on the side you yes. never saw coming. Yeah. So so how how'd you do both? So how'd you prepare an effective yeah. almost a risk register or but a but a risk plan? Yeah. And how'd you prepare for every possible risk? Again, it's a it's a great question. And again, I'll try and answer it relatively briefly. So it is important to identify your high priority risks, those that are either likely or would have an enormous impact on you. So if you're a financial services business, you would be cavalier in the extreme not to be planning, for example, for a cyber attack. So it is important to identify your priority risks. And it is actually also important to develop risk specific checklists or playbooks to address those high priority risks. However, what you must not do is only prepare for your high priority risks because of exactly what you've said, Ninda, what about if you prepared for your top 20 risks and it's the 173rd risk that emerges or to your point, the one that nobody could have predicted? The answer to that is your overarching crisis management plan should be, can I put it this way, should be risk agnostic. It is a process, a way of working and operating that will help you, guide you and enable you to succeed whatever the crisis is. So at its simplest level, it will define a way of activating your team who needs to be involved in this crisis it will guide you through that how will we get them together either virtually or physically where are their contact details they're all there so really simple things like that it will give you an agenda for that first meeting whatever the crisis is these are the things that we need to cover off in this in this first meeting it will give you a template for your first media holding statement. Yes, you will have to clearly do some work to tailor it to the particular situation. But if you save 10 or 15 minutes by having an initial template there, that's 10 or 15 minutes that you can use really effectively. And it's also things like, you know, my example of strategic intent, documenting in the plan before you start doing anything, set your strategic intent. Um, so for me, the worst kind of crisis management plan <laughs> is the most comprehensive crisis management plan, because if it's totally comprehensive, it's going to be this thick and nobody can use a plan that is that thick in a crisis. A good crisis management plan provides a framework, checklists, resources and processes, which, as I say, can be applied to any crisis to give you a purposeful and structured way of working. And what we found, for example, with some of our clients was some of them actually did have a pandemic plan. Some of them did, many didn't, but even those that didn't, the ones that had a crisis management plan, that set them off on the right foot in the first days and weeks of the, of, of the pandemic. So um, I would encourage people to do both, have a plan which guides uh, your approach in any crisis, but do have checklists and playbooks for your top risks. So what you're saying is, if you get into the habit of thinking about risk, yeah, you're more likely to come across the ones you never thought of because you're doing it yeah. more regularly. And and by thinking and preparing for it regularly, you will be more just mentally more prepared for it. Yes, because you've been working on it. So. so so that's part of the sort of the planning process. Yeah, there's a, there's a technique that we, you know, teach clients called the four board system, which I won't go through in great detail, but basically it's a way of making sense of information in a crisis. That, for example, can be applied to 
any situation and is enormously powerful in again aligning the team and driving through the right decisions and actions so again it's about having processes and ways of working that will assist you whatever the situation is we've even had you know clients say actually we've uh, we've deployed some of the techniques from the crisis management plan in business as usual because you know they enable you to work in a very structured purposeful swift manner which sometimes is very useful in business as usual as well as in a crisis i mean during during this conversation you've talked about leadership quite a bit and I, i've sort of hinted at uh, it depends on the size of the business the sector but a leader is a leader mm -hmm. irrespective of size yes so, so, so in, in sort of all the studies you've done and all the characteristics you've looked at um how can you spot somebody who's an effective crisis leader uh, and, and interesting people are um, and i'm sure they'll explore later how boris did in this crisis you know did he have the characteristics yeah. was he the right type of person to lead during a crisis yeah was he the right type of person to lead when things are going good and you want to move on so yeah are there are there sort of examples of people that you know through all the sort of research you've done that can indicate and show you the kind of characteristics a good leader under crisis has yeah and i think i think the first thing i'd say is actually one of the other benefits of rehearsing exercising is you get to see under pressure the qualities and char characteristics not just of the leader but of the other members of of that team and you sometimes have surprises good and bad surprises sometimes someone who you hadn't realized had got this ability to you know stay calm under pressure it's not the person you'd expect it is brilliant in a crisis equally you do sometimes get someone who is hugely effective you know when things are going well but for a number of reasons are not cut out to be uh you know a a crisis leader that aside um i guess some of the characteristics of the really great crisis leaders are that they have you know deeply held values that they deploy in a in a crisis so you know crisis management is not about putting on an act of being seen to care for example effective crisis management is actually caring so many crises in fact almost all crises have a human impact therefore you are looking at someone a leader who has you know qualities of empathy humanity authenticity care and compassion and of the um kind of political leaders around the world the one that i really love every time she you know has to face a crisis is the new zealand prime minister yeah. jacinda ardern you know there was the terrorist attack at the at the mosque they've had earthquakes my goodness i would want to be led by her her humanity her communication skills her genuine passion and and emotion is so engaging she is a brilliant crisis crisis leader you do also have to have some harder skills as well so the courage to make timely decisions even when you don't have all of the information and in a crisis you never have all of the information so being willing to assemble the information that you do have quickly taking soundings from your trusted colleagues and advisors but then to go do you know what we don't know whether turning left or turning right is correct but based on everything i do know at this stage and based on our values i am going to make the decision to turn left and the worst decision in a crisis is no is no decision at all so having the courage to make those decisions based on values and based on analyzing the situation is another characteristic of a successful crisis leader i, th I think it's a great example you gave i mean that is great a great example it's also interesting uh, what again back to the greg reed uh, conversation about crisis management uh, he did use the word empathy yeah and he and he did also use the word communications yeah uh, and communicating to people so they know which direction you're going yeah. and importantly why you're going in that direction yeah uh, and people will then then they do they do tend to 
follow. A um, couple of questions before we wrap up. This has just been yeah. fascinating. Um, golden rules for a successful crisis response. So you've suddenly been hit by COVID. Yeah. Uh, you didn't see it coming. You didn't plan for it. The future looks uncertain. Um, what are the golden rules to manage a crisis? So in any crisis, your objective is to exert influence over how that crisis plays out. And interestingly, talking about the pandemic, I think one of the things that the government could be criticised for in the early stages was not really shaping or leading how we kind of worked through that crisis, but appeared more to be reacting to events, sometimes too late, rather than being proactive in shaping the situation. So, so, John, so let me just interrupt it, but it could be argued that the last time we'd had a crisis similar to it, was it the Black Death or something? I can't remember yeah. they said this in the Black Death, I, God knows, 100 years ago. Yeah. Um, and that part of the crisis management rule is working on what you know has happened before. Yeah. And there was nothing to go back on. So, you know, it, so how, how do you do, uh, how do you manage a crisis? That's just generally speaking, that's never happened before. So the crisis itself, you cannot predict or yeah. control. Yeah. But what you can do is you can control what you do yourself. You can control what you do. Yeah. And I think one of the most powerful tools for getting ahead of a crisis, and again, it's one that is, if you don't know about it or don't think about it, is easily overlooked, is scenario planning. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is, you know, in the first day of whatever the crisis is, don't have everybody from your team together in a room, in a huddle or on a call in a huddle. Get a couple of people removed from the main team and say to them, I want you to think about what could happen next. Where could this situation go to? What is the worst case? What are the absolute nightmares that we could be facing tomorrow, next week or next month? Bring back to me your doomsday scenarios of where this could go to. And the phrase we use for selecting the people to do that job is look for your most creative pessimists. Um, so <laughs> we've all got creative pessimists within our organisations. They're great at scenario planning. When they bring that back to the boss or, or, or the team, what that will enable the team then to do is to say, God, yeah, it could go to this awful worst case or this may well happen next. What that means is you can actively take steps now to do whatever is in your power to prevent the crisis going in that direction. But even if you can't prevent it, you can develop now your strategy, your actions and your materials to be deployed if that happens. So, you know, let's say it's a it's as simple as you know again i use the the example of a of a fire people have been taken to hospital clearly it is possible in the worst case scenario some of those people might die let's not wait until they die before deciding what we're going to do and say with regards to their families and their colleagues and what we're going to say to the media it's an awful thing to have to do but to have actually thought about that before the event enables you to do that job more effectively should it happen. So um, scenario planning is a really good way of getting ahead of the crisis and exerting influence, if not total control. Final question, um, fascinating session. Uh, if there's one thing you would advise listeners to do and viewers, this is on YouTube mm -hmm. as well, tomorrow, which prepare them for a crisis, what would that be? What's that, that piece, one single piece of advice for tomorrow? So unintentionally, it kind of flows on uh, almost from my previous answer, but in a slightly different way. I would encourage uh, people watching or listening to think about some of their most serious risks and with their colleagues 
to sit down and just talk through how would we respond to this situation and what might happen next and what resources might might we need so take some time now to as i say identify what decisions would we need to make and in principle what would those decisions be again if we take cyber attack as an example you know when would we notify the information commissioner you know under what circumstances what would be the criteria for when we notified them would we communicate proactively with our customers why why not what are the factors that process not only enables you to rehearse decision making it also identifies where you lack resources so going with the cyber example again it might identify do you know what if this did happen we'd need proper cyber specialists on our team let's find them now rather than googling them when the crisis happens and the thing i would add to that suggestion of you know spending an hour scenario planning with your colleagues do that virtually because even if you have an existing crisis management plan and i'm sure some of your viewers and listeners do that plan is probably based on having a team of people around a table in the same room so just be very aware that if you have an existing plan but which has not been tailored to a virtual environment again you would be hamstrung if you hadn't worked out exactly how we're going to operate under these current conditions that we're working under so scenario planning and in particular how would our team operate in a crisis in a virtual environment okay. oh actually actually ninda there's one other thing i, I should say um crucially importantly which is why i need to say it sit down and take the learnings from how you did respond to the pandemic because there'll be some really great things that you did that you would want to replicate in the event of a future crisis and there will have been you know understandable mistakes and learnings that you would want to address before the next crisis so actually in a again a structured and purposeful manner saying what went well what didn't go so well what actions do we need to take to make sure that we're geared up for the next crisis I read something a couple of days ago, and I'm trying to desperately find it, but it, it was a brilliant, brilliant line. And again, it takes me back to what Greg Reed said. So he said, um, and it was in here, it's, it's, in, it's in the book, it's brilliant. Uh, and the line was, um, businesses are run bottom line. Businesses are run by spreadsheets. Businesses are run by data. And when a crisis happens, two people become very important the accountant because he says this is what it's going to cost us to correct it then the lawyer who says this is what it's going to cost us if we admit to this 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 and this and i can't remember who said it in the book but somebody said in the book the two people i don't let in my room are the accountant and the lawyers <laughs> because they'll tell me to do exactly what i shouldn't be doing which is focusing on the customer yeah and making sure they're comfortable and, and that's what greg said in he, when he was doing the turnaround was yeah we had all this data but actually we have to think about the customer and then make the data fit and and i i, I can't find it but it was a brilliant it's, um it's a guy called john mccain who was the ceo of a canadian uh, meat business called maple leaf where they had yeah. listeria in their meat products that's right and exactly your quote he said there are two people i'm not going to listen to <laughs> yeah. in handling this crisis my, yeah. my my lawyers and my accountants and you know i think what i think what he really meant he may have meant exactly what he said but i think what he really meant was maybe you do listen to them but you know what we are going to do what is right. right thank you for your advice i appreciate it we are now going to do what is right and it might cost us a bit more than yeah. in the short term yeah. but you know what it will cost you a lot more in the long term if you don't do the right thing jonathan it, you won't believe it it's been an hour it was only meant to be about 40 minutes so <laughs> look, just a couple of things to wrap up uh, interesting so my takeaways was yeah it's great to think about the crisis itself but actually it's what you do before mm -hmm. um have a risk uh, management system in place where you're regularly thinking uh, and I, yeah. think, I think the example you gave on 9 11 was brilliant uh, regularly get people used to thinking about risk mm -hmm. uh, and and if you take care of your customer you probably reduce 
the chance of that risk happening, back to my example of lawyers and accountants. Uh, you talked about leadership being empathetic, the importance of communication and being proactive. And I think most people, uh, and I guarantee when I post this and say, this is about crisis management, mm -hmm. I would reckon most people will think, ah, oh, this is going to explain to you what to do when you're in one. Yeah. But actually, you're, you're flipping it the other way. You're mm -hmm. saying how to avoid, or at least when you get in that crisis, you're better prepared to yeah. manage it because of what you've done before. Yeah. Then, then actually, so I, I guarantee that's what people will think. But I think the message you've brought here is one of preparation, yeah. one of ownership, uh, and one of being very rigorous in the way you think about risk. Um, Jonathan, brilliant. It's, it's, it's a great book. And, and, and I know we're going to do a feature on risk in the next issue yeah. of the Business Influencer. Uh, but this has been fascinating. Thank you for taking an hour out. Sorry, it's taken longer than <laughs> no, we no. thought. But, uh, but you said some brilliant things there. And I think they're applicable. And here's my final comment. They're applicable whether you run a PLC, a FTC, and very importantly, even if you run a small little business, yeah. because we're all open to risk and failure. Absolutely. I've really enjoyed it, Ninda. Thank you very much. Cheers, Jonathan. Have a great day. Uh, it's only midday, so uh, have a great day. <laughs> Thanks, Ninda. Cheers. <laughs>